my name is Janet Woodcock, and I'm the therapeutic lead for Operation Warp Speed. But usually I work at the FDA, and usually I'm the head of the Center for Drugs at the FDA. So what is the relationship between Warp Speed, the NIH, and the FDA? How is this all working together? Well, the FDA is completely independent. The FDA treats uh, Warp Speed as a, any, it would treat any sponsor. In other words, a sponsor who develop a pharmaceutical sponsor who develops a drug, they can talk to the FDA. They can get advice and letters and comments and everything. And so can Operation Warp Speed. And we try to get FDA buy-in like any developer would to make sure that the program is going to be acceptable to them at the end of the day. So that's the role of the FDA. Now between NIH and um, uh, Operation Warp Speed, I think this is a rather new kind of relationship that we have. Um, for uh, vaccines, they're using the COVID and the, the, um, the vaccine network that NAID has as, as a sort of advisors and sites, but the um, pharmaceutical firms developing the vaccines are, do, are holding the INDs and running those trials, all right? For, the therapeutic trials that are active trials, that is uh, run out of the NIH. Those trials are, the INDs are held by different institutes at the NIH and they're running these trials. So OWS is sort of the funder and we're also the expediter because if I may say so, <laughs> you know, the academic trials and academic sites are not well known for speed. <laughs> Why? Because they don't provide enough infrastructure to support the investigators, right? And the investigators have other things to do, such as being a professor and doing clinical care and all this kind of stuff. So we're trying to fill in a lot of the gaps in warp speed, not just fund the trial, but <clears throat> really <clears throat> expedite. For example, this may be interesting, and once you think about it, <clears throat> it's actually very difficult to get people to come in when they're sick, right, and have COVID and they know they, they have it, they've been told to go home and isolate themselves. And to get them to come into a site and talk, you know, and get a conformed consent and all this stuff and have an infusion is, is counterintuitive. So, and not only that, but the sites don't want people, infusion centers don't want people who have COVID-19 <laughs> walking around in their, in, in their infusion center. So we're trying to get, for example, um, portable uh, clinic sites, you know, trailers, uh, all sorts of tents, things like that, so that we can carry out the trial safely and have enough space. And, and the areas also that have been overwhelmed have run out of a lot of things like infusion pumps and things you wouldn't think of. And so, you know, we're going to get everything that's needed, for everything from infusion pumps to porta potties, <laughs> whatever is needed, right? And that kind of support, that, that's the kind of speed we're talking about, because each one of those things causes delay, as you know. If you don't have this, then you stop. And so we're trying to fill in all those gaps and make sure those sites can roll. There's a lot of pressure, obviously. We have a pandemic. We have no good therapies except maybe steroids and yeah. some ways of ventilating people. So obviously we need to move fast. Mm -hmm. So how do you move fast and still keep it safe? Um, can you sort of break it down? What are, the, what are the things that you're doing to ensure safety? So I'm, of course, very familiar. I've been head of the Center for Drugs for 20 years in two different stretches. So I'm very familiar with drug development. Center for Drugs regulates the drugs and we approve the investigational drugs. And actually we oversee all the INDs in the United States. So, you know, this has been going on for a long time. So how would you accelerate? And like I said, you'd spend more money. So instead of having one clinical site at phase one, you might have multiple. So then you can enroll the patients faster, right? But you don't skimp on the safety testing that you do on those patients, right? In phase two, you know, you get a huge amount of uh, sites, which isn't typical. You test a bunch of doses and um, you, uh, you know, you, you get the answer quicker because um, you have more patients enrolled and you have the same exposure you would have had 
of patients to the drug, but in fact, it's happened much faster because you got the patients in all at once. And then, you know, the phase three trials, say for the vaccines, <clears throat> They're trying to enroll 30,000 people per vaccine trial, you know, in the space of a few months. And that's taking the military and all kinds of help, you know, to get those people uh, enrolled, get the product to them and enrolled. Uh, answer me this if you can then. So I'm an ER doc and I've got a patient and I want to enroll them in a study. Mm -hmm. Do you already have sites? that are enrolling? Are you adding sites? Is there a role for clinicians to call the FDA and say, okay, we'd like to be a site? Where do we stand with it? Yeah, well, it wouldn't be the FDA, it would be NIH or Operation Warp Speed. And we're trying, mm -hmm. to, we're just starting the studies, okay? Um, because, you know, except for uh, products that were already available and then could be repurposed, getting specific for, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 products available, you know, took a while. But now we're starting, we've started two studies with monoclonal antibodies, one for outpatients, which would be for ER docs, okay, and one for inpatients. And these drugs are uh, specifically designed to neutralize uh, the virus. And so these are the first specific therapeutics that weren't repurposed from other uses um, and actually are directed at the virus. So we will, should get up, we've just opened those. We don't have many sites open, but within the next few weeks, we should have a large number of sites open. And we'll have, should have a web page that refers. And there is a specific emergency room trial going on for convalescent plasma. It's called C3PO, and there's only a limited number of sites that are doing that, but they are, um, you know, enrolling people in the ER who, who are infected and, um, and not sick enough to um, go in the hospital, so they could be treated in the emergency department and then sent home. I ask because it's one thing to, you know, work out your trial design and your randomization, um, but it's all about having the staff there that can actually enroll the patients. If you don't have people to enroll the patients, they don't get enrolled. Right. The docs and the nurses are not gonna do it. So that's why I guess you need specific sites. So let's talk about some specific drugs. What are the sort of the top five things that you are working on right now? So you said one, monoclonal antibodies. That's, I assume, genetically derived. Um, you can mass produce that, right. uh, is that right? That's right. So monoclonal antibodies can, were rapidly produced uh, using commercially available platforms. A lot of them were taken from the um, blood of patients, you know, B cells of people who had recovered from the virus. But they have ways now to select antibodies that are highly neutralizing. So they grow the virus in vitro and they can show that it doesn't grow, right, if you put this antibody on it at very low concentrations of antibody. So that's an extremely good sign, but of course you don't know if it's going to work in vivo. So there's a large number of programs going on, about 50 monoclonal antibody development okay. programs around the world. Uh, only a few, maybe a handful are in the clinic yet but some of them have started phase three trials or late phase two trials. So, uh, you know, we hope that uh, those will be useful and they would potentially be useful all the way from prophylaxis, um, say in a nursing home outbreak or something like that, all the way through outpatients to all the way through sick inpatients. So there's a whole lot of those, and they're going to be tested by the trials we're sponsoring with NIH in um, outpatients and inpatients. And then we're also supporting trials like in nursing homes and so forth of prophylaxis. So uh, two questions. One, is this going to provide three months of protection possibly? And when will we get some results? We, you know, it depends on how effective they are. <clears throat> and 
<laughs> and what the event rate is. Because if they're really, really effective in one of these situations, then we'll find out sooner because one of the interim analyses will be positive, right? Um, we would hope by the end of the year, we would have even regardless if they don't stop the study early, we would have information on some of these. I think the prophylaxis trials are going to take a little longer. Now, some of the antibodies, not all of them, some of them are engineered to last longer. So they would provide potentially, if this is true and it all works out, longer protection than a few months um, uh, in people. So that's one class of drugs. Another class is antivirals. We don't have small molecule antivirals that are uh, specifically designed for this virus because that would take too long, right, compared to where we are now. So we have repurposed small molecules, a number of them, and we're certainly interested in working with NIH in getting those into trials. Um, we're very interested in oral antiviral, okay, that could be used by outpatients, keep people out of the hospital, make them recover faster, decrease their viral shedding. So that's a whole nother class. And then the class that's gotten the greatest amount of research done on it in clinical trials are the immunomodulators. <clears throat> and they're generally being used in, um, in patients who are very sick to try to mitigate the hyperinflammation that we see at the sort of end, later stages of this disease in very sick people. And there are many, many trials going on of these type of agents. And so it's hard to pick through and figure out which ones might be effective. And other than dexamethasone, you know, which is very effective, uh, we don't have uh, other tools right now. Timelines for these? So monoclonal antibodies, we might have some results at the end of the year. Immunomodulators, any big studies that we'll be hearing about soon? Yes, there's a trial that NIH is doing, not through warp speed, but is baricitinib, which is a JAK inhibitor, small molecule. That should read out sometime in this month, I would imagine. And there are many other trials going on around the world that will read out at different times. Whether they're, um, I think the um, NIH trial will be fairly definitive. Some of the other trials, unfortunately, a lot of the trials going on around the world are very small. Now, I do want to talk about another series of trials that are being launched <clears throat> that are interesting, and they do involve outpatients to some extent, and probably would be very interested to recruit from the emergency department, and that is of anticoagulants. Um, there's a fairly significant rate, even in people who aren't yet hospitalized, of pulmonary embolus and other type of thrombotic events. In the hospital, there's a you know, relatively high incidence. And then even in the convalescent period after those people are discharged, they're at risk for thrombosis. So the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is doing with OWS support trials. They're going to be launching trials in each of these scenarios. The inpatient trials are set to be launched, but the others, the outpatient trials are going to take a little bit more time. And to your answer your question, you're probably going to ask me, right, when will they read out? It'll take a while because like these large cardiovascular trials, they take um, a long time to do. They need a lot of patients. So with, is that a low molecular weight heparin? So again, I'm an ER doc and I see a relatively sick patient doesn't need admission. And I say, go to that clinic down there off the FDA website and enroll yourself in a randomized trial? Yes, that would, that's what we hope will happen. And we hope to have materials out there that will um, enable every, all practitioners to point patients to. This would be the, in, the outpatients, would be people with the elevated D-dimer, right? And um, who, who were, were pretty sick, not your college student, who got COVID-19 at a bar and they're just have a little fever or something like that. But yeah, they're going to try antiplatelet agents and, um, and some other uh, uh, anticoagulants in these different settings. So when people talk about uh, warp speed, I at least would go automatically go to vaccines and we've been told we're going to do all these vaccine trials, but at the same time, we're going to produce the vaccine so that if it turns out one of them or two of them or three of them work, we can start to distribute. Is the same thing happening for therapeutics, which is where you're working? Yeah, to some extent, certainly with the monoclonal antibodies, because they would be the only specific therapies. If we get enough of a signal for some other intervention, 
um, then we might accelerate the production of that. Uh, and that's mainly the antivirals, right? Because most of these other products are approved already and they're being repurposed. The most of the immunomodulators, anticoagulants, these are all tried and true therapeutics that are being repurposed. So they don't need the same help that a vaccine uh, and the vaccines have to be produced in mega numbers <laughs> too. In the billions. Um, yeah. I would ask you to be highly speculative. Of, of all of the things that um, the FDA is working on, are there a couple that you're most hopeful about and why? Yeah, well, remember, I'm Operation Warp Speed right now. I don't represent the FDA. They're completely always agnostic about anything, <laughs> right? But in Operation Warp Speed, we've put a lot of um, credence down for therapeutics against the neutralizing antibodies, against passive immunity. And why? Because it's worked before in other diseases. This disease it appears the virus is sticking around a long time, you know, unlike some of the other respiratory viruses. And if that's the case, then being able to neutralize the virus or inactivate it in some way might, you know, be a really hopeful sign. So we have put, and that's why these trials were designed and are, you know, uh, continuing to enroll um, assets, to use assets that uh, are, are neutralizing antibodies, but they aren't all the same. We have cocktails, we have products that have their FC modified, for example, as you ask to prolong their half-life. We have ones that have the FC receptor um, inactivated in some ways because people are worried about antibody dependent enhancement of disease we have you know we have this we have multiple different types of antibodies that we'll be looking at and we even have polyclonal uh, IgG that we're going to be looking at also hopefully but it doesn't mean that a lot of antivirals of course are <clears throat> can be used against a number of different viruses as you know and so um, there were there have been antivirals that have developed for influenza or uh, SARS-CoV-1 that uh, now people are trying to repurpose for this virus and certainly they're of great interest too and you would put some money down on them because their probability of success, you can see pretty fast, you know, you give it to a bunch of people and if you don't budge their virus load, then you kind of give up on that, right? So um, those two categories, I think, are the most um, promising. The how to treat the late stage of disease, I think is gonna take some time and effort and understanding that above dexamethasone or other corticosteroids. And I think the communities already voted with their feet about anticoagulation. The question is in what circumstances, what doses and which agents are, are the best in this situation. From my point of view, and I've you know, been a professional regulator for a long time, these are very high quality registration trials that were conducting. Um, we are not cutting corners on safety or on learning from these trials. In fact, we are able, we've been able to put in place a lot of science activities underneath the trials. I think that will really enhance what we've learned from the trials. So I think um, people can be confident whatever we learn. I mean, the products may not work and that's something we're just, uh, you know, we expect for some of them. So, uh, but we are trying to accelerate by um, providing, by working in, ser ser in parallel rather than in series, number one, and then by providing uh, much more resources, uh, much more substantial resources and help than clinical trials are used to uh, having to, to accomplish their goals.